car and drove out to the mountains in Austria and then drove down the coast of Croatia. And it was amazing. And we're like, wanted to do something like that for our... Uh-oh. Ah! All of a sudden, I started hearing my voice on a YouTube stream. <laughs> <laughs> You fell for it. <laughs> I did. I knew I got bit anyways. I was I was trying so hard. But anyways, it it takes <clears throat> minimum like 12 hours to travel that far. And like yeah. now with two children, we can't get away with taking a 3 yeah. minute or a 3 week vacation. So So that's why Lisbon sounded so appealing. Lisbon right? is amazing. 6 hour flight. Yeah. So what's it's... what's your favorite part about Lisbon so far? Well, I've just been doing like conferency stuff so i haven't seen much of it but it's just like it's beautiful like absolutely yeah. stunning the food is amazing yeah. it's all seafood like yeah yeah, yeah. seafood <laughs> and it's just it's really like quite amazing like it's like warm too the whole week it was supposed to be raining and yeah. thundering and like we haven't had a single drop of rain so we're like very luck we're like very, we're like thanking all the rain gods <laughs> doing yeah, the dance yeah doing everything <laughs> but. It doesn't get like super hot it looks like like i i, I thought like oh it's probably gonna be because it's pretty darn close to africa you know what i mean yeah. on a map you know and i'm like in my brain like that's really hot right it's Yeah, I'm also experiencing that. We can't hear you. But like in and out, I wonder if it's your like cables, maybe. Did you try turning it off and on? <laughs> Twenty seconds. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, but the audio quality is not as good. Uh, it doesn't bother me. I think it's fine. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to use my good mic, but um, I think there's like a, I think there's like a break in the cord somewhere. I don't even know what to do about that sort of thing. So. so I'm hearing Skype notifications on my thing, but I can't turn, maybe I can take her notifications off. Um, how would I do that? <laughs> Does anybody, is, I think there's some people on YouTube. Does anybody on YouTube know how to turn off notifications on Skype? Yeah. <laughs> crowdsource this. Uh, chat notifications. Let's see. Oh, I'll just turn on do not disturb. There you go. Yeah, that's a good idea. I like uh, it. Let's see. Yay, it doesn't work. Good job. All right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> nailed that. Let's do the thing which does work. Yeah. So, <laughs> Oops. Did it. We did the thing. Hold on. I'm all off Matt now. Oh, go to call. Okay, we're back. We're ready. Ready to rumble. <laughs> that was close. Good times. So Lisbon has fish. Yeah, yeah, lots of seafood, lots of tiles, seafood, pastries, wine, all the good stuff. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Good times. And it's only a six-hour flight from Boston. Um, do you have to go through customs before you get on the plane in Boston, or... Once no. you land in Lisbon. It's once you land in once Lisbon. Right? Land. Yeah, and it was so yeah. funny because, like, the customs person didn't say a single word to us. Like, we just passed our passports. They stamped it, and, like, we were in. I was like, whoa. Like, this is oh, that's, that's so cool. easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I got to go to I gotta go to Toronto next week, and it's the first time I'm traveling internationally since pre-COVID, and I couldn't remember where I was going to do the waiting. Um, so that's good, though, because I have a very early flight, and I don't want to show up early to the yeah. airport. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Cool, cool. Alf says that I uh, that I think he I think he's saying you look like Ed Sheeran. It couldn't be me. I don't look like yeah, Ed Sheeran. I, I don't know. I think it might be me. Yeah. Might be, yeah. Good, good call, Alf. <laughs> do you, do you um have a guitar? Do you sing? <laughs> no. 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 I just listen to music. That would be a good I, Halloween costume for you. The yeah, Ed right? Sheeran. Yeah. Yeah. I I've been uh when I when I uh pre baby weight I was uh, uh I went as a uh, uh, Shoot, what the heck's his name? The the redhead from uh, Harry Potter, Ron Weasley. Ah, yeah. uh, I was I was a pretty good Ron Weasley for a little while. That seems like an easy, like a cheap, yeah. like a cheap date, like a very easy one. <laughs> put on put on a robe, grab a stick, you're good, right? Done. <laughs> Everybody gets it. All right, cool. Um, so I guess are we are we here to talk about Harry Potter and Portugal? Yeah, I, I think that's what I got in the email, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, as as you can tell probably by my shirt and by my records here, we're going to be talking about uh, patterns, right? Um, sort of. I mean, like, eventually we'll get there, right? But the reason we're here today is to talk to Kate Reed and... Hello, Kate. This is Kate. Hello. <laughs> and what she does is she takes... She takes like uh, uh, stuff from nature and crazy uh, stuff from software, and then uh, a bunch of like uh, like uh, fashion or like big ideas about uh, 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 like uh, like human interaction with the outside world, and then sticks it in like a Nutri blender, right? And then just like hits full speed on the thing, and then what she pours out is this beautiful, amazing stuff. So she's going to show us some of that beautiful, amazing stuff today. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't know. However you want to get started, Kate, what do you think? Do you want to you want to do? Yeah, I can show my screen, tell you a little bit about myself, um, show some projects. We can stop and chat. We can do whatever. Um, oh, man. Yeah, so you can see my screen, right? I can. That's awesome. Good. So thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, as you said, I'm Kate, and I'm really interested in basically how do we interface with things around us and interfacing with the natural world. So that's like my kind of big, I guess, big like question that I'm always asking is like, how can we make the way that we're interfacing with, you know, our materials, our technology, our furniture, our products, everything? How do we make that feel natural? Um, and so these are kind of like I'd say like my three main interests are, um, I'm really interested in the ecology. So how does everything that we kind of do and work with kind of link into the like world around us and things that are not necessarily human and how do we fit into this bigger picture? Um, I'm very interested in nature and synthetic biology. So I actually um, like kind of as a hobby, I'm like in a molecular biology lab and I like to kind of grow stuff and see how we can start to like modify nature. Um, and then I'm also like very interested in community. Um, I'm a musician as well. I play the cello actually, and I was um, a street performer for a decade and at Boston's Faneuil Hall, if you guys have ever been there. Um, and that was like a wild, wild time. <laughs> you know, lots of, lots of funny stories of like what happens when you show up on the street and try to do weird things in front of people. Like, <laughs> I like you learn a like lot. <laughs> I like defiant jazz as a uh, as a genre name. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't know about Severance, but that was that's a Severance reference. If anyone's seen it, it's very good. All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So these are like some of my, I guess, some of my like greatest kind of interests are like looking at kind of architecture and things like that. These are a few projects that I absolutely love that I think like kind of set the tone for a lot of my work. So the one on the left is this really crazy project where basically it's like combining um, like parametric design and kind of like all this like crazy cool CAD stuff with kind of these like natural systems where things can go wrong. So this project on the left was like these music halls that were actually like dug out of the earth like they were designed, dug out of the earth, and then tarps were laid, and they poured concrete over and made these like incredible like rock formation music halls that are all. Oh, so that's like, like the negative space. Like that's yeah. like, I was like, how is that formation even like yeah. real? Like, Isn't that wild? Well, and then it was like cool. the whole thing was like modeled in CAD, and then they had to like excavate 
the CAD. Like, it's just like a crazy <laughs> process, but like the results are like so cool. Yeah. Um, so that's like a really, really cool project by Alvin. Um, the one in the middle, I'm really interested in sound and how we can kind of trick our everyday, um, like our everyday kind of how we can bring play into what we're up to. Um, but I'd say that my main inspiration is this one on the right, which is just like, I love noise. I love things that we don't intend for. I love like mm -hmm. adding as many processes as possible to basically have a mistakes happen and like create these amazing projects. Um, so Super that's kind cool. of like, that's like me in a nutshell. I guess like formally, I kind of have a background. I went to high school at MIT um, at this really cool program that was like all 3D printing and building. And so I've always had like exposure to kind of like CAD thinking and stuff like that. Um, they went on to college and I got to undergrads, um, which is super cool. And then I've been at Dassault Systems as kind of their artist in residence, their researcher in residence. Um, and there I have this like amazing lab of toys to play with and just build things and try to make the strangest things possible, basically. <laughs> Very cool. You're doing a great job at that so far. Yeah, good. So I can show you some projects. So this is kind of like what I was saying at first. Um, so I'm really interested in like, how do we interface with kind of the things around us, interface man with machines in ways that feel natural. Um, so I have a bunch of different projects that kind of are like, different ideas of how do we bring kind of the natural to like the physical. Um, but this is like the first one that I'll start out with and it'll just get crazier from here. Um, but this is this project that we, that I did in um, kind of the X-shaped DSO systems ecosystem. Um, and this was like looking at how we can make like basically modular vertebrae and like, this was this kind of wild idea that like we could have these like vertebrae almost as like little interfaces and little pieces of computers themselves. And here you can see kind of like the lab that I get to play in all the time. Um, but thinking of like how we could have each vertebrae almost be like a different sensor and then like link together these like custom kind of computing interfaces. Um, so here we can see like the process of like all the way from CAD through 3D printing, and you can kind of see like some of the amazing toys I get to play with at Dassault. But super cool. I love I love how you were able to like uh, like I, I remember I, I I've I've been lucky enough to see some of like the behind the scenes stuff. Um, and I remember when you were initially like, yeah, I'm so I'm trying to like create this like vertebrae and X shape, and I was just like, what? <laughs> yeah. Dude, what? And then I like saw the model, and then I was like, "Oh, yeah, that actually does make perfect sense, and it looks just like it." And um, how how would you even do that in parametric CAD? Like, you really couldn't. You need a tool like like X shape in order to be able to to model that like quickly and easily. Um, yeah, I mean that's so what I think is like the most fun about like some of the DS stuff is like the softwares are so specific that like the process of making is like so closely linked to the output, which is like very, very exciting. Like this vertebrae couldn't have been made. Like it, I mean, it could have been made in SOLIDWORKS, but I like have a headache even thinking about like how I would get the smoothness. Like it's very exciting kind yeah. of like the different, the different ways that you can kind of like link the softwares together to get these like very cool effects. Um, so this is this project. We can like fast forward through it. Or we can leave it. It's like it's almost done. Um, I love how you're using a uh, uh, cork for the uh, the area between the discs. Uh, I had a herniated disc recently, so I, oh. I know way too much about this model. Um, but yeah, the upward dog helps. So yeah, no, it's so that. funny because I like my, I I show this. Um, my my dad is a physician. I like show it to him, and he's like, "Oh, well, this is this, and this is that." And I'm like, "You know, I just made this up. Like, it's not a real yeah. medical model." <laughs> no, this is the C six uh, vertebrae right here. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Cool man. Yeah, and so this is like, these are some other cool projects. This I'll maybe go through this next chapter, and then we can like chat about it and stuff. Um, sure, but sure. this next kind of like chapter of things I was really interested in was like. You know, 3D printing is so amazing. It's so cool. But like a lot of times the things that we make are very static. And so I was very interested in like how can we start to like design 3D prints that, you know, move and how can we design things that like make it so that we're not necessarily like stuck to like our print bed size. Um, so that started this like whole kind of like journey of projects. 
Um, and this one is like a 3D printed knit, basically. So each one of these little rings were like uh, 3D printed individually. Um, and then it was like, just thinking of, like the challenge was really thinking of like how, how big can we make something that's printed on a tiny, tiny printer? Um, yeah. These are like moving into like the X Gen kind of parametric world. So this was like the first 3D printed net. Um, oh, I was just wondering if this is modeled in X generative design. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And so then I kind of went in onto like chain mail and thinking of like 3D printed chain mail, which is like sure. a very like traditional thing to like 3D print. Um, so then I started like this is like your classic like X chain mail that was done in X Gen. Um, mm -hmm. So again, like you can model the whole process and then like get the output. Um, but then this is like, this one was actually very exciting to me because this is like a non-traditional chain mail um, kind of like set up. Like if I pause it here, oop. like, I don't know if you can see my mouse mouse, but like the way that these are is yeah. like accordion folded as opposed to X. So this one was like actually very exciting because this grew to like, um, like two and a half times the size as it did when it was printed. So it right. printed as like very dainty, delicate, um, like little, little like uh swirls and then like as soon as i took it off it like really really grew which was yeah. like a very very exciting process um, cool. yeah no x gen is like amazing for stuff like this too because at first i did like a mock-up and you know like solidworks or whatever and i like did my sketches and it was just like i can't make rings for the rest of my life <laughs> <laughs> like i was like nice. you gotta find a way to do this better <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, like, uh, and and that's that. That was like the thing for me in X Gen when I first started approaching it. It was like, okay, how do I create the sort of patterns that I would create in SolidWorks over here, right? And I'm kind of like translate. It's like uh, I always think of it as like uh, like like learning a new language, right? Like you initially learn a new language, you learn all the vocab words, and then your brain is like thinking in English. But then you have to remember, like, oh, yeah, like, the word for orange is naranja, right? So <laughs> my brain thinks orange, and then I go, orange equals naranja, and then I think naranja, right? But eventually, yeah. you get that, like, switch in your brain where now I'm thinking in the other language. And when that happened for me with X-Generative Design, where I was able to, like, think in X-Gen, um, like, the stuff, the patterns that I could create were just... You, you can't do it inside of SOLIDWORKS. It's just, you can't do it inside of any kind of parametric modeling tool because it's just not built that way. Like, uh, yeah. it's just wild, wild stuff that you can do with XGen. I love it. Yeah, no, that's like, I feel like my love for XGen comes from this idea of like me being like, not like fundamentally, but like quite lazy in modeling. Like there's so <laughs> many things where like, I, you know, you model it in like SolidWorks or whatever, and you have to change something and you have to go back in, change the dimensions, and that sometimes throws something else off. And like, yeah. I love this idea of like, you can model something one time and then like, you just plug and play whatever you want in it. You know, you want a texture on a surface, you model it once, you can plug and play. And like, yeah. I don't know. I love the idea of like, how can we extract like, me as like a maker designer like from the actual design process like i want it to run without me i don't even want to have yeah. like artistic control like <laughs> love it but i guess that's like more like what i was saying earlier about like the noise you know i like i love when the machine just figures it out but yes. yeah so this is like a cool project too um or continuation again of like thinking like how can we start to print things that like go beyond the print bed um, so this was also an X Gen, and this was like, I thought this was quite clever actually. This like parametric skirt. So these like pieces are all three D printed, um, and they have basically like the holes. You can't necessarily tell, but the little dots are like um, tell like they're bigger on one side and smaller on the other. Yeah, sure. And so the holes all have like corresponding little nooks. Um, and this was like a very fun slash very painful project. <laughs> um, because it was like I printed it out and I, I wanted it to be super snug but ultimately what we had to do was like dip the pieces in boiling water for like 40 seconds and then yes. really quickly put them through the holes so it, like it gave it just enough give um, but it yeah. was very funny because in the making of this process like the bigger it got the more like hot water was like everywhere <laughs> <laughs> nice
Yeah, yeah. So, that, that... so that's actually like a skirt, and you can essentially. So the idea is that you can change like the positioning of those, like to your liking, <laughs> assuming you have you know an infinite supply of boiling hot water. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, the so, thing is, is, once you boil them once, they're, like, pretty... You can take them in and uh, out. Oh, okay, okay. Like, yeah. All right, all right, all right. Cool, cool, cool. But, yeah, this was, like, yeah, like, basically, like, how can we start to create, like... Really, like, thinking of, like, body architecture and, like, modular, like... How can we make not only, like, modular wearables, but also this idea of, like, you can have this skirt that can actually, like, then clip into the wall, almost. Um, but which, these like, are things I think about all the time. Body yeah. Body architecture. <laughs> how can I... <laughs> How can I plug myself into a wall? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is, like, <laughs> the two kind of in, like, the more, like, final form. Um, uh, so on the left is, like, the chain mail all pieced together in this, like, large... Oh, wow. That's actually the chain mail stuff. It's yeah, cool. yeah. It honestly looked like, uh, it looked like it could have been crocheted or something, you know? Like, it yeah. was, like, a crochet, like, dress or whatever. Yeah, no, it was, like very satisfying to work with and I think my favorite part about the chain mail is like when you print it you take it off and it's still quite like um stiff like you still can it like feels like a piece of cardboard and then what you do is you like actually like crush it and you hear it goes like and like all of a sudden it becomes like bigger and fluid and like has like full range of motion it's like very exciting how close to fabric it it got um that's super cool I love it and then on the other side is this skirt, which, like, is a little bit clunky, but is very fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you got your Fibonacci spirals. I remember those Those are something else I saw early in the process. Yeah. 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 No, those Fibonacci spirals were, um, those were, those were a good time. <laughs> <laughs> those were, like, surprisingly trickier than we right? would have expected. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like this is like basic math that's been around for centuries, yeah. and it's yeah. Uh, but the good news is uh, the cool thing about XGen is like once you've gone through that process of like figuring out like that thing, you can literally just create a user operator and you could call it like the Fibonacci button, right? Mm. And now it's basically like I drag that node in, and it's like I've got like a, a macro for lack of a better term. That's just going to generate a Fibonacci that I can, a Fibonacci curve that I can, uh, you know, manipulate the parameters for, right? Um, yeah. You only have to do it once, which is cool. Also, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're a huge uh, football fan like myself. And uh, <laughs> I don't, if, you, if you ever have a chance to go to uh, an, an L.A. Rams game, I think the outfit on the right, you could, you could totally fit right in there. I take it on the Jumbotron thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. World's biggest it's like LA full Rams face fan. paint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. No, I think that's one of like the coolest, or that to me is like also why I'm so interested in parametric design and this like X Gen way of thinking is like, because ultimately like before you know before you had this way of like modeling algorithms, there was a lot of these like algorithmic things that were happening around us that weren't really like straightforward to model in like CAD space. But I think, like, that's one of the things that's so ex exciting about, like, parametric design is, like, the fact that you can model kind of, like, Fibonacci and model a lot of these, like, parametric processes that are happening all around us. Um, like, I think about, like, you know, the way nature grows and the way everything kind of grows and develops is very, like, closely linked to parametric design. You know, I think about, like, a sunflower and how a sunflower grows. And it's, like, ultimately you have your inputs and your outputs, like, you have you know, the sun, which is a variable, the water, which is a variable, you know, like all of these different things that like, when you actually start to understand what those variables are, you can kind of model them in parametric space. So I think that's one thing that's like really interesting is like, how do we like kind of take some of these like natural processes and natural like algorithmic type things that are happening and like start to model them. Um, so that's like also a lot of what I'm like excited and interested about. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see, this is another cool project. Um, this was like starting to think of how can we take some of these, like the parametric modeling processes and um, like make them kind of bring some of the computing ideas back and bring some of the interfaces back. Um, so this was a recording I just did right before this showing the process for this one. Um, and this was like, it's funny cause I started this project thinking a lot about like magnetic fields and all these things and then like, 
X-Gen had just recently had an update and had this like cool new quad mesh thing. And I was like, oh, I got completely distracted in this like quad mesh world um, and ended up making this like kind of exciting project instead. But basically what this is, is like creating like these like random maps um, or like generating these random maps kind of based on these points. Um, and I was just like totally in love with the output, how like how much of a drawing it looked like, like looking at the kind of this in three dimensional space from every angle. Um, so I got like super into this one. Yeah. And then I ended up turning it into this like wearable piece, which we can see here in this video. Let's see, hopefully the sound goes through. So, you know, that's like, that's what we'll all be wearing next time we go out partying or for Halloween or for something. We'll be walking around. <laughs> Can I get one of those for my trip to Lisbon? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I think, I'll, wear, I'll wear it at the clubs. Yeah, I think so. Or I think like even put it put it on like a, instead of having like one of those, like, you know how some parents like will put their kid on like a string instead of having that, they can like have them glow and light up or like tie the balloon instead. But... <laughs> That's actually, that's actually great. I love it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, I also, who's, is that the same? I asked you one time who the artist is that uh, does the music. Is it, is it the same artist that you have doing the music in a lot of those videos or is it different ones every time? Yeah, there's a lot. They're all just like free music.com. Like, <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. I, I, I like it. I, I, I'm into it. Uh, but I, I probably wouldn't listen to it on its own. It's just like cool music that ha that's going on like while like yeah. <laughs> showing your stuff. Yeah. Um. Super cool. I, so and you tied in like it, was it an accelerometer? You tied an accelerometer to like change the the light. Yeah. So that was like with the accelerometer, and basically like the idea was like we can create this like kind of like random map in kind of like XGen and in these like computational programs. And then, like, we can map kind of our live body data to it and, like, create this, like, weird mapping experience and, like, these weird performances. Um, but that was, like, very simple circuitry, like, just an accelerometer with some LED lights. Yeah. And, like, secretly in between the lights and the map, uh, like, the 3D print was just um, bubble wrap <laughs> to diffuse the light. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you know, some of these things, like, look so glamorous, and then all of a sudden it's, like, you know, all of it's just very much everyday materials and everything. Yeah. Um, Super cool. Yeah. So I can show some more work. So this one actually doesn't have, um, this one isn't necessarily super 3D modeled, but it's a good kind of leeway into the next one. Um, so this is like, like, so the idea that I'm really interested in is like, how can we make our relationship to technology feel natural? Um, and so the answer to me is like, if we want to feel natural, we can copy nature, we can start to work with nature kind of like through these computational programs um, like XGen and kind of model these systems. Um, but one of the things that I'm also really interested in is like AI and like how can we kind of start to implement like AI and artificial intelligence and machine learning into like basically how, how we make things feel natural. Um, and so this project, let's see, yeah. So this project is a project that's looking at basically how can we kind of train this like uh, AI image generating algorithm, um, which is called a GAN, which creates images. Um, and it's looking at how can we train kind of these like image generating models to start to like make, um, like to start to make kind of images that are interesting and exciting for us. So this image was trained with thousands of images of moths, as well as like thousands of images of human eyes. And the idea was that you know, after training kind of the scan, it starts to output these moths that have human eyes on the back of their wings. Um, and yeah. kind of like the question for that was like, how can we start to use GANs and how can we start to like use kind of this, like use this thinking to start to trick some of our synthetic systems. Um, 
And surprisingly, which was like super cool, super crazy, is like these images that it generates, um, security cameras actually think that they're real human eyes. <laughs> and so when you're walking by a security camera, it'll like put the little square around your like image basically. And we'll yeah. say that's a person. And because of that, it won't necessarily get like your, your it won't pick you up. Uh, yeah. That, this was like a super cool project of basically like how can we use kind of screens and machine learning and artificial intelligence like for our own privacy. Um, and so this like this project actually makes you like invisible to surveillance, which is like super, super like cool and trippy and like interesting. Like how can we almost like how can we use kind of the same technology that we made to create these systems to actually combat it? Um, yeah, that's why. <laughs> my so my 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 favorite uh, literature genre is definitely dystopian futures. Um, okay, so awesome. this right up right up my alley, you know. So I'm I'm big into that. Super cool. Um, I also like how the uh, human eye there like temporarily turns into a goat eye. Which is yeah. Cool. <laughs> it's like it all gets like more and more uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good so stuff. That so then like the next step to this project was like, okay, so we can have like, um, we can start to train like AI to trick, you know, AI itself. But then the next kind of question and generation of this project was like, can we start to train AI to trick natural systems? You know, can we train computers to trick like animals and tr to trick real things? Um, yeah. And so this was like the next iteration of this project, which had like, wait, which had like five times more screens um, and these are like screens on your Apple Watch or like whatever, a small watch, like the same exact one. So this had five times more screens, um, you know, <laughs> 3,000 more images involved. This was like way kind of a big step. Um, but this was this really exciting project that was made for um, 3D Experience World last year that unfortunately wasn't able to go in person uh, because it got uh, kind of postponed to be remote. But this was a project that was all designed on the X apps and Dassault systems, um, the X Gen, X Shape, and X Design. And this was looking at flowers. So this um, AI was trained with thousands of images of flowers to start to create its own kind of synthetic flowers. And the idea was that um, by kind of outputting these synthetic flowers into the natural world, we could start to see how many different like bugs we could start to trick and how many different animals would be like actually interested in these fake flowers. Um, so Super this is cool. kind of like the final the final output as an image, but I can show you this really cool process video that shows like how the whole thing was made basically. And this took like, I don't know, I'd say this probably took two and a half months or three months to like get all the pieces because again, there was just so much going on. But here we can see it in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> spend all this time doing something and then it's like one little video yeah <laughs> here's yeah. all this work i made i hope you enjoy it <laughs> yeah it's like 
what's not in there is like my sweat and the tears. No, what's really not in there is that that like video alone. I think each screen had it's either eight or thirteen wires, and we had forty screens. So there was like, I mean, there was probably five hundred wires I had to each solder individually. Oh <laughs> so I had to like keep track of. I mean, that was like a total. Sometimes bigger is not always better, I will say. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I learned from that one. <laughs> nice, nice. But that was cool. a super cool one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I do have to know, though, I know, like, you know, what you make is prototypes, right? But how much did that thing weigh? It seemed like it weighed a lot. So that was, that was also something that was really funny. So that project, here, I can pull back to the picture of it so we can look at it. But yeah. this project... Um, one of the really cool things that, that we were doing is we we're working with form labs to kind of like who just unveiled this new form 3l printer so it's like an amazing form labs resin printer that's like much much larger in scale yep. and so we we're like oh my gosh this is so great we can make something to make on the new giant form labs like it'll be a double you know like we can kind of like send everybody love with this project yeah, um, yeah. and what ended up happening was we printed this kind of huge hat um or the like helmet part out of the resin, yeah. which I personally had never resin printed before. So I had no sense of like how heavy it would be. Sure. Um, and it was like the maximum bed width of this like new form labs printer. Um, and it, I mean that the head alone probably weighed at least like, at least like 14 pounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason in the yeah. image I'm like kind of carrying it up. Right, right, and that's right. definitely something that like I was not anticipating. So it was so funny because when it was for 3D Experience World, we had both kind of the Form Labs version printed out and ready to go. And then we also had like a normal um, like FDM printed. Right. Um, with like, infill with a bunch of ready. empty yeah, exactly. space in the middle exactly. with just your normal <laughs> lattice. Yeah, <laughs> SLA is solid. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, and that one like weighed like nothing at all. It wasn't fragile. It was like, so it was very funny. But the Form Labs, the clear did look like really cool and yeah, incredible it looks super cool you can see the light coming through it yeah i was actually surprised i think maybe i saw i saw this at some point uh in person maybe it was the fdm one um that was in like probably like clear pla or something <laughs> um but yeah uh super cool um yeah i didn't realize there were so many wires to each <laughs> to each bit screen that's crazy yeah um, no it's it's wild. Once you start working with electronics, your life just um, becomes exponentially messier or like just like there's just so many things to work with. <laughs> what do you do you use uh, for like your uh, like I, I forget what the uh, proper term is, but like uh, computer learning or AI or whatever uh, for when you're like feeding something, a bunch of images and trying to get stuff out. Is there like is it like open source stuff that you use for that or is it what do you what do you use for that? Yeah, so for these two projects these are both done with GANs. So GAN is kind of an open algorithm um, and the okay. idea is that like yeah, so basically it gives you this like starter algorithm and then you just train it with whatever you want. And right. the amazing thing about that is like there's so much manual labor that goes into doing machine learning stuff and AI stuff in terms of training algorithms like it takes thousands and thousands and thousands of images and so when you start using like these GANs what is really cool is that kind of everyone uses the same GAN and so everybody kind of is adding to its learning and adding right. to its training together so like in this yeah. case I only had to input you know 2,000 images instead of having to input 15,000 images, which is like what right. it would be like to start from scratch. So it's, it's very, I don't know, it's very interesting kind of like when you're working with AI, like also thinking about, you know, who's making the images, who owns the images. Like, I think it's like also like when you're training with thousands of images of other people's like images, who owns them, like there's a lot of really exciting kind of questions of like ethics, which get more and more fun when you add more and more technology. <laughs> More, more for my dystopian future appetite. I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. Hey, we did, we did get, uh, we did get like a, we got sort of a question, uh, which I see in like SolidWorks Live stuff all the time, and I'll answer it real quick. Um, uh, and then if you want to jump in, you can. It was basically like, hey, like, how do I get more training? Like, how do I like learn more of this stuff? 
right? Um, and my suggestion always is, uh, like, especially for people going down the engineering road, is find stuff around your house that's been made by somebody and figure out how to model it. And then if at all possible, take it apart, right? Like take the thing apart into a bunch of little pieces um, and figure out how all the pieces go together and why, like ask yourself, like, why is this hooked up to that? For what reason? Um, and I think that that is just like a uh, super, super helpful. And um, I actually was a, I was a, uh, for for a brief stint, I was a I was a teacher at this uh, uh, like weird like it was a public school, but it was like for math and science kids that were like way too smart. And um, they uh, uh, one of the one of the electives was basically this guy that was a super amazing, super smart engineer would come in with like a, a van full of like random devices, like old TVs and computers and scanners and mice and whatever and and like part of it was just like all right here's like here's like a bunch of like screwdrivers and whatever take everything apart just take it all apart and figure out what you can do with the pieces right and figure out why it was put together that way and um i feel like that's something that uh people used to do a lot more but now (laughs) netflix exists so maybe it doesn't happen as much i don't know like it's something I used to do. It seems like it's something you probably grew up doing too, Kate. Yeah, yeah. No, I've definitely taken my fair share of things apart. I think, do I always put them back together? And no. Do I sometimes regret that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like if you have a, if you have an old mouse that you don't use anymore, a computer mouse, then by all means take it apart. But yeah. I'm, not, I'm not taking apart my mouse right now because I will not be able to put it back together. But, but yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, and I got think trouble for like, that thinking about like how do you start to like learn yourself? I think one of the things too for like parametric modeling and kind of this like procedural modeling like XGen and what we're doing is it's really helpful to like join some of the communities and like chat with other people who are doing it because like some of these things like it's just such a shift of thinking of the process that you're doing things. And so I think like for me, one of the huge game changers was like when I joined um, the like made in 3D community that like comes yeah. with the license basically. And I could like start posting my work and posting like the problems I was running into. Cause it's like, until you have that shift of like this, I, this actually like makes a lot of sense to me and this feels natural to me. It's sometimes these like the simplest things can be very hard to wrap your head around. So I think like the more you can surround yourself with like other community members who are doing kind of things like you or who are interested, you know, yeah. knowledge sharing is the best kind of sharing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. Like we have, uh, so we have the, uh, SolidWorks users forums, uh, which has been around forever that has a bunch of like SolidWorks information in it. Maybe you didn't know that there's also other 3d experience communities that, um, may touch on SOLIDWORKS, but also touch on all this other stuff. And that Made in 3D one um, was actually one of the first posts that I ever saw you post. And I think I went in there and I may have been one of the people that comment on that because there was like a question in there about like a Voronoi pattern. And I'm like, I know about Voronoi, yeah. right? Um, and it's just like how uh, it's it's a great way to like connect with other people that are using the same types of tools. But there's also like people in there that are just like uh, making stuff. Right. It's not just not, it does not necessarily connected to the software. It's just like, wow, I never would have thought to do that. Right. Like, I, like, that's so cool. And that gave me an idea of maybe I can do that sort of thing on this other medium, you know, for this other purpose. Right. Uh, so super cool. I think I, up in uh, SolidWorks just dropped the forum dot SolidWorks dot com. I see uh, Jordan Tadich, uh, who's actually uh, he's he's pretty good at surface modeling, just not as good as me. Um, but he knows where some of these other uh, uh, platforms are, uh, some of these other communities are. Uh, maybe he can drop uh, some links to, like, the Made in 3D community. And I think there's a public X-Generative Design community as well um, that we could give people a link to if they want to hop in there and, uh, you know, poke around and see if there's uh, some cool stuff to help them get them started. Yeah, no, cool. that sounds, that's so exciting. And I think the other thing I'll say about the communities, which I was not expecting, is that there's so much material knowledge like in those communities. Like for me, like I'm not necessarily like 
super wood is not like necessarily my medium I'd go to. And so I always have wood questions and I'll like post a question within 20 seconds. People will tell me like the most creative solutions around it. Like going from computer to physical world can be so tricky sometimes. Yeah. And so it's really cool to have like people who have a space where everyone has kind of done that transition in different ways. So yeah. super cool. Yeah. Honestly, without 3d printing or like, uh, like, uh, like, now there's like just really cheap ways to do like CNC and router stuff on on wood. Like without that, I I don't I don't know what I'd do. <laughs> like, I, know, not, like, uh, I don't know. Like I uh, like I I learned how to use like a uh, like a, a drill press and a mill and a lathe like a very long time ago, and I'd probably just like get a shard of metal in my eye if I tried to use one of them now. But yeah, well that's the <laughs> idea of like you know. It's not laziness, but it's like I don't want to have to make everything. I love like when the computer can take some of that, some of that off. But also, craft is beautiful as well, of course. Cool, cool. Yeah. So, so I can show you some more cool stuff. I mold heels. Is that what's going on here? Yeah, yeah. So these are looking at like kind of what I was saying earlier about how we can um, like model some of these natural processes through these parametric um, design systems. So these are shoes that are actually grown around the foot the same way mushrooms are grown. So in the case of kind of like X-Gen thinking, this is like basically what we did was we created this looping algorithm. So the output of kind of this like bubble creating algorithm is fed into the next, is fed into the original. And so you get these like really cool kind of wavy um, forms. So these were kind of these mushroom shoes, which are super cool. And so these are all done through like the natural growth algorithm. So how do we kind of mimic, like, how do we, how do we kind of like create digital twins essentially of these natural process processes? Um, so this is another one that's looking at um, meandering coral. So how does coral grow? Um, and meandering it. coral grows like really cool. It uses this like curve differential growth logic algorithm. So it basically is like things grow at different rates at different times, which causes it to wiggle. Um, so again, the whole algorithm was designed of this, and then I could just input these different curves. Uh, these are the mushroom shoes, which use the same um, which use the same logic as the differential growth. So differential growth is like a really cool kind of idea that's found in almost every plant, and it's this really simple idea of things grow at different rates at different times. And so what happens with that is if I have a side here that's growing really slow, and this side's growing really fast, it's going to start to kind of like wiggle and bubble in on itself. Uh, so in the case of the mushroom, it's just a 3D differential growth algorithm. So it starts to almost like bubble out. Did you have to take diffy cues in college? Differential no. <laughs> uh, that was, I, yeah. I, I don't know there's so many people on the call that, that still have like uh, PTSD from differential equations. So. Oh boy. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, if I br sorry if I brought it up, guys. I apologize. Calculus yeah, is yeah, hard. This, so, this is a happy for some place. people, <laughs> math is hard. Oh, Andrew, Andrew Gross is like, oh, I love differential equations. Of course he did. Of course. <laughs> he did. Oh, boy. Cool. But one of the things I really love about, like, kind of 3D printing and digital manufacturing is you can start to, like, pair, pair things with, like, living things. So one of the things that I'm really excited is how do you, like, pair these, like, digital twins and then print them out or, you know, manufacture them and then start to pair them with, like, living collaborators. So this is looking at, like, how barnacles would kind of interact with pansies, um, which is super cool. And so we can start, start to have these kind of, like, living material conversations. Super cool. And I guess that brings me to my second area of interest. <laughs> um which is looking at how do we actually work with living materials and start to like grow the materials ourselves. Cause through like parametric design and X gen and all these amazing like simulation softwares, we can start to grow things digitally, but how do we actually work with living materials ourselves to grow things physically? Um, so that's kind of what brought me like into this next uh, chunk of work, which is really excited. So, um, so this is kind of a, a piece that was made through kind of these like laser cut molds. Um, and this is just looking at like Voronoi um, inspired by dragonfly wings. So here we can see kind of like some of the modeling um, that was done in X-Gen to make this. Um, and basically what we're working on right now is this is like looking at how we can laser cut a mold essentially 
And then how can we start to kind of grow living materials within that mold um, and grow kind of things from that and have like these like idea of self knit um, and self kind of self knit and self making structures um, as things grow. So if you go to the next slide, I think we have a video that we can see. super cool like i like I, I think of the shape right and then i go like okay like the the, the only way i'm in that shape is if i 3d print it because i'm not smart enough to feed that into uh like a like a, a a cnc program that could cut it right so i'm gonna i'm gonna 3d print it right but then it's it's static it's hard it's you know i can't i can't afford a, a 3d printer that is gonna print something that's like super rubbery right but you are like, oh, I'll just grow grass in it. Like, yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, that one was like really, really wild. I have to say, we ended up making, I think only two molds we had to make, but we had to like restart the grass like three or four times just to like figure out, like get in rhythm with like the grass growing in it. <laughs> Cause the first, I think the first time it got very, very moldy, um, oh, which was sure. not super fun. <laughs> Yeah, right. But yeah. by the end, we kind of, like, got in the flow and, like, almost had this, like, hydroponic system. Um, yeah. Which is, and, like, the craziest part of this is, like, you're going from seed to shirt in 10 days. Like, versus, like, normally if you think of kind of where, how our clothing's made, like, all the way from picking the cotton or whatever your material's made of to spinning the yarn to knitting the material to then cutting the material. Like right. the process of a t-shirt often like goes across multiple continents and takes like yeah. actually quite a long time. But this was like 10 days, you are done and it can be eaten at the end or it can be saved in your closet. It can't be washed. We haven't figured that out yet, but <laughs> <laughs> don't try that. <laughs> if you can eat it, you don't even need to wash it. Right? Yeah, you don't need to. Wa yeah, it's salad. It's your shirt dinner. during the day. It's your dinner at night yeah, and you have a new one the next day. Right, you yeah, just gotta get like them the in a rotation. Vegan experience. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate vegan experience. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Good stuff. But so that brought like then that like kind of started all these other questions of like how can we really start to work with our materials and work with our materials while they're still living? Um, and so this kind of brought me to like my second home, I would say. So half of my time is spent at Dassault Systems in the lab. And the other half is spent at um, this open biology lab in Boston called Boston Open Science Laboratory. Um, and this place is really cool because it's basically a biomaker space um, that's available to anyone who wants to learn science. So I ended up finding myself there because at a certain point I was working on growing too many things and the lab was becoming very sticky and very smelly and... I was doing things that weren't necessarily like in the that weren't necessarily the best environment for also like these like very powerful machines. Um, so I found myself to this molecular biology lab, and there's where I do everything that's too messy for Dassault Systems. Um, and so here we're working with how can we start to kind of actually genetically modify some of the things that we're working with um, to create materials and colors of our own. So this is a project of. Um, growing pigments and growing living kind of how can we start to grow living pigments and living colors and patterns um, using biology and so this specific project is looking at textile dyes so thinking of you know we can grow things computationally we can grow materials like men did the last project and now how do we actually grow the colors that we're using to like 
work with these materials. Um, so this is a project that's looking at bacteria dying. So one of the amazing parts about bacteria is that bacteria grows exponentially. And so what that means is if you're able to make a bacteria that is um, that is like colorful and that can have kind of the properties that you want. In this case, I was looking at how can we make a dye for textiles. Um, and the cool thing about that is we can create this kind of textile dye because bacteria grows exponentially with hardly any water and hardly any liquid versus now the textile dyeing process is like extremely polluting because there's so much liquid involved and it takes thousands of gallons of water to kind of dye like a single vat of clothing um, versus this project is looking at how we can have very, very little um, water and very, very little like actual waste come from the dyeing process and it's because it's all grown and continues living. Um, so that kind of like brought me into this like new new era, which is kind of where we are now of like really how can we grow things physically and um, computationally. And so here we can see like some of the swatches. Um, so some of these like dyes were grown in a test tube. So just by like kind of soaking up all the dye in the fabric, like a traditional way you dye something, excuse me, and that's what creates like these more consistent colors. Like if you look at the one on my neck, that dark purple. Um, but the really exciting thing is some of these were grown on top of a plate, like the images I showed earlier. And those images that are grown on top of a plate um, create kind of these amazing patterns in these really cool like shapes.